So, good morning, night. Welcome to the first VTS webinar facilitated by the Academy. The first in a series of three that will also cover VTS training and VTS assessment. The former webinars generated good questions and discussions even after the event took place. Also, the Ayala LinkedIn discussion group has never been so active as now. And I hope we will continue connecting at this platform to discuss technical matters. So if you have an aids to navigation or a VTS challenge out there, drop a line in the Ayala LinkedIn discussions group and someone around the world may help you out. I will now give the floor to the Secretary General of Ayala, Mr. Francis Zakaria, for an opening address. Francis, the floor is yours. Thank you very, very much, uh, Girardine. And from me, a warm welcome to all of you to this uh, webinar organized by the Worldwide uh, Academy. And I'm uh, thrilled to see that we are almost 100 people joining uh, this event. That is fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Uh, I've been asked to, to, uh, to welcome you and also to uh, say a few words about the importance of VTS. And I would do it very short because we have some very, very interesting speakers after me. But uh, you know the new VTS manual is on the street. Uh, but I would say already in the VTS manual in 2012, the trends that we are living under today in the maritime operation and management and also the consequential impacts of VTS was addressed in a very, very clever way. And that was under your leadership, Tonche Cirelli. <laughs> Congratulations with that already in 2012. The trends were focused on safety and especially efficiency. And, and efficiency came in after the uh, economic collapse uh, in 2008-9 after the World Trade Center with faster and more reliable cargo handling and larger volume of information, maritime special planning, also for recreation uh, vessels and recreation areas and the demand for coordination of port services. That was all described in 2012. And the technology trends were larger and possibly unmanned ships. And there was a request for capital expenditure and trained personnel. I will uh, just uh, show, uh, share my screen and show a small PowerPoint. Let's see here. Uh, bear with me just a second. Should be on your screen now, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. So <clears throat> uh, the consequences are that VTS will play a central role in gathering information, more automated systems, Exchange of information between VTS will lead, in my view, to VTS networks. VTS information will increasingly be used by allied, allied services in the global tracking of vessels. There will be need for quality insurance, need to certify VTS operators' competences, need to manage unmanned vessels, small ships and recreational craft all together in the same area, uh, as the quality and accuracy of, accuracy of vessel tracking improves, put, there will be a potential for greater control. More control and greater exposure will also lead to uh, more liability to the VTS uh, centers. So I think actually that we will see an expanding role for VTS uh, in the future. We often talk about VTS as the front office of e-navigation, and I could very well imagine the VTS as the center of gravity for coastal state management in the future. Over the last years, as you know, Ayala has become the main organization for VTS harmonization, training, and guidance. As you probably know, 
by now, seven states have now have signed the convention that will transform IALA from an NGO to an IDO soon. There's no doubt that the role of IALA will, as is the case for VTS, also expand. Some states have even talked about IALA as the organization for the coastal state's responsibilities and the center of gravity for digital maritime harmonization. These trends, such as uh, globalization and the extensive use of new information and communication technologies, have already provided opportunities for enhanced interaction and information sharing, not only between ships and shore based authorities, but also <clears throat> with and between many other stakeholders. The, the complexity of the use of the maneuverable space for shipping is growing. As a result, safe navigation and accessibility in many seals, coastal and port approach areas worldwide are being challenged. The need for proactive management of vessel traffic in these areas is rapidly growing, as well as the need for enhancement of the interaction between ships and relevant shore base authorities. Mm -hmm. Management of operational space from uh, shipping uh, perspective by involving VTS, supported by the capabilities of e-navigation and its maritime services, and in conjunction with the development of guidance for maritime spatial planning, are seen as candidate combinations on how to deal with the challenges ahead to secure future safe and efficient navigation. And we saw many of these uh, examples in the uh, uh, e-navigation VTS combined symposium here some weeks ago. It is expected that the current task and traffic management functionalities of VTS, as it is reflected in the future IMO resolution, um, that will replace the well-known resolution 85720 and the various ILA recommendations and guidelines will extend and be executed in an increasingly innovative manner, responding to, ch to changing users' needs and public expectation. The worldwide, harmonization, the worldwide harmonized provision of present and future vessel traffic services, the procedures and usage of technologies shall be the aim but focus should be kept on these two basic principles. Even if harmonization is the goal for IELA, we should always keep in mind that there are important differences due to geographical and other local circumstances, and that the, that the, that the determination and decision rest with the local competent authorities. The decision on VTS must always be based on the solace requirements for risk and level of traffic. It is envisaged that the strategy and vision of the future delivery of VTS may have an impact on current legislation, responsibilities of organizations, service provision, coverage, procedures, training, technical infrastructure and equipment. And it will also in some stage and in the future change SOLAS Chapter 5. ILA's role <clears throat> is to continue the, the development of all relevant aspects of future VTS and contribute to the development of the emerging concept for the sustainable maritime transport system. Finally, I'd like briefly to draw your attention to guideline 1102 VTS interaction with allied and other services. And I know that was also one of Tonchai's babies. Allied services <clears throat> are defined as services directly involved in the safe and efficient passage of the vessel through the VTS area. Could be harbor masters, maritime pilots, etc. And there was a um, conference in Turkey uh, that uh, talked about uh, uh, illegal immigration as well as one of the allied services of VTS. 
Other services <clears throat> are defined as services that might use VTS data to undertake their work more effectively. That could, that could be to ensure local security or preventing illegal imports. I think this is a view into the future, but also an example of the bumpy road ahead for VTS. VTS can also be controversial and seen as a threat to some functions. Pilots might fear for their position and jobs. Ship masters might fear to lose full command of their ships, etc. There are many stakeholders in this game, and we must have them all on board in a friendly and constructive manner. Otherwise, we will not succeed. So, Sherdin, I thank you and everybody for the attention. And I will stop sharing my screen and leave the floor to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Francis. This series of technical webinars are developed to address some specific challenges related to BTS worldwide. Each of these webinars include a lecture on such a topic, a case will be presented, and you will have the opportunity to discuss or ask questions. The subject of today is VTS implementation. As during travel work, we keep on receiving the same questions, and we realize that in-depth information is needed. And not only the academy and its experts can provide you the answers. Actually, you can harvest the best experience from the VTS community. For example, as you see in our audience, Mr. Tunjiai Chigriri, Ayala Honorable Member and former Chair of the VTS Committee. Tunjai, we are very happy to welcome you here. So please use this webinar as a platform to connect. Before we start, I would like to inform that there will be a question and answer session at the end of all presentations. So please feel free to write your question in the chat box or raise your hand. And after the official uh, webinar closes, recording will be stopped and the line will stay open to chat. And I must say that we truly enjoy the, to be able to catch up with you by this means. The recording of this webinar will be posted on the Ayala YouTube channel afterwards, of course. And for now, to save bandwidth, please switch off camera and mute your microphone. The first speaker of today is Ms. Monica Sundklev, working as a senior advisor at the Swedish Transport Agency with responsibilities to develop, coordinate and regulate various fields of maritime traffic including ship reporting and VTS. She is the present chair of the VTS committee. Monica, the floor is yours. Thank you. Geraldine, and also uh, hello everyone, uh, dear colleagues, Ayala Secretary at Worldwide Academy, and not least also my predecessor, Tunchai. I'm really happy to see you in the audience today. Uh, let's see here if I can actually do the uh, screen sharing here. I will do the... Are you able to see something? Yes, I Is see it? your screen. Thank you. Perfect. So I was invited to talk uh, about what steps to take when implementing a VTS. Um, and I will uh, start with a very, very short uh, information about the VTS committee and the structure that we have. For the moment, uh, as I said, I, I am the chair of the committee and uh, I have as my vice chair Dirk Eko from Germany. We have three working groups in the VTS committee uh, where we deal with different um, issues and tasks, and they are very self-explanatory, actually. We have uh, operations, technology, and BTS training. And what we do within these uh, work, we have several standards and topics uh, related to the VTS work program um, 
actually the Ayala work program. But for BTS, we work a lot with the standard 1040, of course, which is the standard of vessel traffic services. But we also have um, a lot uh, of other issues in the other standards, as you can see here. I'm not going into details of those, but we have a various spectrum of different issues to uh, deal with. The framework that we do, uh, discuss and, and develop, so to speak, and that we have behind us also is most of all from IMO. It is the SOLAS V12, of course, and the Resolution 85720 Guidelines for Vessel Traffic Services. And what you can see, uh, for those of you who have uh, been following the VGS committee lately, uh, you know that uh, Ayala has also uh, put in a revision of that resolution. I will come to that a little bit later. Also, within Ayala, we have several standards, uh, and uh, we have one standard, I should say, and several documents that is mainly the basic for implementation of the of a VTS, and I will not go into the details. You can see this later on, but we have first and foremost the recommendation R0119, establishment of ETS, of course, the risk management toolbox. We have guide, sorry, uh, we have the uh, guideline 1150, establishing planning and implementing a VTS. Uh, guideline 1083, standard nomenclature to identify and refer to a VTS. 11.42, the provision of local port services other than BTS, and G10.71, uh, establishment of a vessel traffic service beyond territorial seas. And as you may see here, we will propose to withdraw that one as that information has uh, been taken into other documents instead. It's going uh, out soon, but I will give you information uh, already. Uh, guideline 1131 is about setting and measuring BTS objectives and a new guideline that has not been approved but will be uh, discussed and uh, hopefully approved at Council in June is competences for planning and implementing a BTS. So there is no number on that one yet. Uh, also, not to forget, we do have the Ayala BTS manual and I will also come back a little bit more with that one. But the purpose of VTS, as you all know, SOLAS Chapter 5, Regulation 12 talks about that VTS contribute to safety of life at sea, safety and efficiency of navigation, and protection of the marine environment. Adjacent shore areas, work sites, and offshore installations from possible adverse effects of maritime traffic. That is more or less monitoring and controlling the area that you uh, have uh, jurisdiction of. And also contracting governments undertake to arrange for the establishment of ETS where, in their opinion, the volume of traffic or the degree of risk justifies such service. So according to SOLAS, of course, it is the contracting governments that have the main responsibility for dealing with this legally in each state. What about the VTS developments then? Well, VTS has existed in various forms since, we believe, 1948. So it has uh, been a long journey from this to this, where you can see several more very modern and uh, technological um, both buildings and equipment. And how is vessel traffic services defined? IMO resolution 85720 defines it as a service implemented by a competent authority designed to improve the safety and efficiency of vessel traffic and to protect the environment. The service should have the capability to interact with the traffic and to respond to traffic situations developing in the VTS area. And that is a core definition of what is meant by a VTS, actually. I need to mention that the 
IMO resolution, uh, as it's being revised, this definition is slightly changed as well, but the core remains. Also, the resolution 85720, um, as I mentioned here, uh, was revised, and the key areas that was considered important to revise and update was a lot. There was a, uh, an old resolution. It was not uh, changed after 97, 1997. It's nearly 25 years ago. You know how much developments there has been in technical developments since 1997. Also, we wanted to uh, make sure that the responsibilities of the roles that uh, of the competent authority, BTS authority, also including the uh, government, the contracting government, that roles that they have. There has been also confusion over the years of the different types of services that was provided by BTS. You know, the information service, traffic organization service, and navigational assistance service. Now we propose to delete all those kinds of services. It is only one service. Vessel traffic service should be able to do whatever they are uh, able to do in the area and not divided into different uh, services as such. That has been, uh, that was really a very good outcome of several meetings and workshops that we have. And I would say that it was 99% in favor of that proposal as well. IMO resolution also had a complete annex. Uh, almost half of the resolution was on BTS qualification, training and certification. At 1997, there was no, not many of the model courses developed by Ayala, but that has been a very big development ever since, and also other guidance, guidelines and recommendations. So now we would like to mention that and point the BTS global stakeholders to look at Ayala documents instead to have that promote training of the BTS model courses and also to promote everything else that uh, concerns the IALA standards and what we need to do within a BTS. That's some issues that we have discussed on this one. And as you may see in the beginning here, it is now up for final adoption uh, at Assembly 32, which will be held in December. 2021. So we'll hold our thumbs and hope it, the result will be good and then we will see when it will be taken into force. As I mentioned before also, uh, we also uh, produced recently Ayala VTS manual. It is a new manual. The edition is number seven, but this, sorry, the structure is in accordance with IALA standards. So you may very well use it as a, uh, to look up different uh, standards and see whatever documents that lies beneath it. Is it a recommendation? What kind of guidelines are beneath it? So it's more or less very much look, look into it. Where do I find the guidelines? And it's very short uh, notice about what it's about and a link to where you can find it on our website. It will also be electronic, electronically updated. So we believe that after each VTS committee meeting, we will uh, have a, a, a procedure how to update the different new versions. It could be a deletion of other ones and uh, content of, uh, of different versions. So please keep uh, your um, please keep, uh, look, look into Ayala website, I should say, to, to see that which version is the latest available on the website. Thank you. Now, back to the core issue here. So why should we implement a BTS? There has been a lot of discussions on this. Um, what are the responsibilities of a state to implement a BTS? And they are different, I can say that. But 
according to an author which is stated in the in the Ayala BTS manual, is that before deciding whether or not to implement a BTS, there are two fundamental questions to be addressed. What are the safety, environmental and economic consequences of having a BTS or not having a BTS? And what is the level of investment that can be justified to improve the safety and efficiency of navigation, safer life at sea and the protection of the environment for a particular waterway, port or even also an area, coastal area. And this includes both costs, which is associated with the implementation and the cost afterwards that you need to consider for operating a BTS as such. Because you need to consider that implementation and operation of a BTS is a significant investment. And you don't want to have a BTS that, has, that hasn't got the means, the technological um, equipment to run that in a way that the, the goals cannot be achieved. So when you think consider this, you also need to consider if there are any alternative measures to a BTS. If you have a volume of traffic or degree of risk, not particularly justified to establish a BTS as such, what can you consider? There are some issues that you could be uh, discussing locally, of course, or regional. And one is passive traffic measurements. Could you improve any of the ACE to navigation that is within the fairway? Could you uh, change the pilotage requirements for the fairway or the port as such? Could you have space allocation policies, if necessary, in your local bylaws? Or could you possibly uh, implement ship routing measures? TSSs, traffic separation screens, recommended routes that you know uh, exist in SOLAS V10. And you can see a picture of that on the, on the right-hand side. Ship reporting system can also be implemented on the basis of SOLAS V11, but you need also to consider that a ship reporting system normally requires monitoring and equipment and may need IMO adoption depending on where it will be situated. The last here is also, could the area be and the goals, what you want to achieve, be provided from a local port services? The provision of LPS, two vessels, berth, terminal operators, or other port stakeholders, could they be also helping out in that matter? Uh, BTS committee has developed a guideline on uh, 1142 on the provision of local port services other than BTS, which is a different sort type of center or services. They are not they are not uh, able to uh, interact with the traffic and they uh, are not either trained as a BTS operator normally. More information in that guideline. Back to the main guideline that we have uh, on implementation. It was recently changed the title of it. So now it's called Establishing Planning and implementing VTS. And how to start a VTS project as such. There are, uh, you can divide activities to three more or less uh, uh, project activities within such a work. I call the first one establishing, we call for a regulatory framework. And then you have two planning and also to be implementing, which goes a little bit hand in hand, but you will see uh, uh, later what is meant by that. Where you can, where you need to describe how uh, a plan for a VTS can be made. 
you need to gather a lot of information about uh, an analysis to determine the need for it. And the implementation plan is, of course, how to implement the different uh, plans and uh, project details that you have found. That was an overview, more or less. The steps I would like to talk about are actually uh, five. Sorry, there are two steps, but the first one is establishing and responsibilities in accordance with the IMO uh, revised resolution, I would say, because that one has more or less more specific details about what it should be. And we hope that this will be uh, effective by the next by next year, actually. The contracting government should at least establish a legal basis for VTS that gives effect to regulation V12 of SOLAS. And, you know, the contracting government, as I mentioned before, has the ultimate responsibility for the overall author authorization of the uh, different issues that the uh, different authorities should do. Therefore, they should also appoint and authorize a competent authority for VTS, which will be um, uh, also uh, possible to establish regulatory framework for it. The competent authority, as you see uh, below there, uh, need to do that framework, national regulatory framework. How should the VTS be developed? How should it be done? Should it authorize BTS providers to operate BTS within certain areas? How should you ensure that BTS training is approved and BTS personnel certified? And they should also establish compliance and enforcement framework in case there are some vessels that violate the regulatory requirements. In overall, the key responsibilities that we talk about and which is mentioned also in, in 1150 includes, and I cannot be too uh, clear on this, the legal basis for the operation of a BTS needs to be, needs to be set down in national law somehow. It needs also to, to uh, ensure that a VTS authority or, as we say, VTS provider in the revised resolution, that, that somebody has to appoint and legally empower a provider to actually operate a VTS. Who will that be? Will it be the contracting governmental state itself or will it be the competent authority for VTS? That's up to each state. And also instructing the BTS authority or BTS provider to operate it in accordance with relevant resolutions and international documents, of course. And it may take time, all these legal bases, when it comes to develop new laws and new uh, regulations, it takes a long time to establish them, especially when you start from scratch. So this step on establishing is really important and it could take some years actually. Step two is the planning and implementing. And as we, if we speak about this, this step is divided into five different sub uh, phases. We do believe that you should have a project management approach to deal with this because you need to have a, these, this is a project and you need to appoint project leader responsible for who's doing what because it is a lot of issues to consider and to document. So you need also, uh, we propose also that you use um, um, some quality assurance, maybe ISO 21500, 21, uh, which can be used very well for this case. The five project management phases that may be used are initiating, planning, implementing, controlling, and closing. 
And I will come back to all these uh, phases uh, more in detail later. So at step two, phase one, we have the initiating phase. That is the beginning of the project. The goal of this phase is to define the implementation of a BTS at a broad level. What problems are there? Do we have a business case? And what you should do, you should have a business case that identifies the need and justification for a BTS evaluation of the benefits, costs, and risks, and provide rationale for the preferred solution. There should also be a feasibility study, which is, is a question of whether the VTS is a viable solution to address the problems. Here, several considerations should be taken into risk, operational feasibility, legality, technical capability, budget, and time. And all this will be also in the report, of course, documented. When it talks about the risk identification, there is, um, to support this one, you could use, very well use the IALA risk management toolbox. In these different three different versions of uh, within the toolbox, you can identify and assess risks in the waterways or also when implementing a BTS. I will not go into detail with this one because I know that a lot of you have already a very well knowledge about the risk management toolbox. But I can say that it's a lot of information gathering and analysis that need to be made. Uh, within the risk identification phase here. As a, as a uh, example, there is in the Annex A of guideline 1150 data to be identified and gathered and further considered when initiating and planning a VTS. And you have 12 different areas where you can find a lot of more information than I have written in, in this one. It's about traffic data, geographic geography of the area, protection of the marine environment, accident and incident data, BTS area, BTS center operations, design and technology, allied services, legal, BTS personnel recruitment and training, future requirements and financial issues. So there's a lot to deal with it and a lot of information to gather and to put into a document for that specific uh, project and area that you would like to follow. Phase two is concerning the planning. And in the planning phase, the scope and goals of the project should be defined and the project management plan should be developed. And this involves cost, quality, available resources and a realistic timetable. All the information that was collated in the first phase will be used here. And key documents that will be uh, developed within the planning phase consists of project plan, functional requirements, risk plan, communications plan, procurement plan, and acceptance plan. And this is more or less, as you may see, uh, a proper project uh, for any kind of project, actually. Phase three, implementation phase, turns the project plan into action by implementing the requirements and tasks that were described in all the plans that were taken, oh, sorry, taken in the um, previous phase. And this is where the deliverables are developed and completed. And particular attention should be paid to quality of it, the risks, 
issues identified, scheduled, and overall project status. And you, if you would like to have a successful implementation of the project, which I would guess that anyone would want to, uh, it's influenced by the quality of the project documents that were prepared before and the communication with all the team members of the project, as well as internal and external, so that you do have a full uh, open view of what is going on, what is not going on, what is lagging, what is uh, ahead, and so on. Phase four, the controlling phase, should measure prog project progression and performance ensuring that everything is in accordance to the project management plan. The project monitoring and controlling activities contribute to keeping projects on track by ensuring that a project remains within the scope on time and on budget so the project proceeds with minimal risk. This phase can also be done simultaneously with the implementing phase and ensuring that uh, it will be met. And, and for the controlling phase, controlling and monitoring should be continuously performed throughout the project as well. So it could be done also with the other phases, of course. Phase five, finally, is the closing. And the closing processes are used to formally establish that the project phase or the project is finished. In the closing phase, the final deliverables of the implementing of the VTS have been met. VTS should be declared operational, project resources can be released, and evaluation of the project should be made on the technical performance of the equipment, operational objectives of the VTS, the VTS personnel training, and if the problems identified in the feasibility study have been alleviated or reduced to an acceptable level. And don't forget to evaluate your VTS all the time continuously. To achieve purpose for which is what was implemented, VTS needs to be effective and to ensure that all the time the operational objectives are being met, technical and operational performance is acceptable, also that the personnel have the training that they have, issues identified uh, also is reduced to an acceptable level in case you also have changed your objectives during some years maybe. And for this, you can use a tool, a quality management system to ensure all these issues. And further guidance can also be provided through uh, guideline 1131, setting and measuring VTS objectives, 1101, auditing and assessing VTS, 1115, preparing for an IMO member state audit scheme on vessel traffic services, which you can find on Ayala website. And that was all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monica, for this very detailed uh, presentation. And I'm quite sure many countries will benefit from this. For the next presentation, we chose to show you an interview made at Port of Antwerp VTS in Belgium. I am quite familiar with this region as Port of Antwerp was one of my stakeholders when serving as, at VTS, as VTS operator at River Scheldt, the river leading to Antwerp. The speakers in the interview are Bart Klaas, who started in 2016 as traffic controller at Port of Antwerp Coordination Center after serving at sea for 10 years. And currently he is temporarily business advisor and project leader within the new VTS service. He is accompanied by Rodrigue Belsma, 
With a background as mariner, Rodrigue worked on board dredging vessels and cruise ships all over the world. And today he is the project leader of the VTS hard and software system and the VTS supervisor. In the case your internet speed would not allow you to watch the video together with us here in Teams, a YouTube link is posted in the chat box, but please return to the meeting afterwards for the question and answer session. So if I may ask my colleague Isabel to launch this video, thank you. Yes, Isabel, we see the starting screen. I believe that this uh, VTS is quite unique in its kind. A VTS, full VTS services in a docks area, including huge locks and many bridges. Can you explain us a bit more? So welcome, uh, Gerardine, uh, at our VTS center in uh, Antwerp. Since April of 2021, we started with our VTS at the left bank behind the Kieldrecht and Kallo lock. Um, and it's now since uh, one month uh, fully operational, so 24-7. And now we are um, implementing the VTS uh, at the right bank. And we think that we will be ready to implement around November or December of uh, this year. Bart, can you specify to us a bit more the users in your VTS? Uh, I consider uh, inland barges and seagoing vessels, maybe some pleasure crafts. Can you give us some numbers, please? Seagoing vessels a day, 24 hours, um, pass around 40 ingoing vessels and 40 outgoing vessels, so 80 vessels in our area, seagoing, and then I think around 200 or 300 uh, movements uh, of inland barges within the port of Antwerp. Can you explain to us maybe some specific challenges you had with implementing VTS in the docks? We had a lot of challenges. Um, it started with a project, how to implement VTS. Um, we had to find, find uh, good personnel, a training program that had a uh, a good level, a high level, so we so we can start with a high standard um, introducing a VTS. But I was just wondering, did you, did Port of uh, Antwerp do any benchmarking with other VTSs? We did no uh, benchmark because uh, here in Port of Antwerp we have a unique yeah, situation. Um, COVID was not helping us to do a benchmark with other VTS centers uh, in Europe or in the Netherlands. Um, so we walked our own way, did uh, our best to get a good quality uh, of operators, also um, a good quality of infrastructure. Um, and we think that um, we made the right decisions um, without a benchmark. Rodrigue, you mentioned silent VTS and this makes me very curious. Can you explain in a bit more detail? Well, one of the first things we needed to do, uh, Jairin, is have a good image of what's going on in our port, in our docks, in our locks. And for that reason, we had to develop a, a system together with our digital and our data analytics team um, a system where our operators and and everyone using the port could make registrations which we could later on use for data analytics and for that reason we've developed uh, a new application uh, for vts uh, standards and uh, for vts performance uh, capturing and that's the silent vts app and uh, with this silent vts app we allow operators to simply register everything they see on the on the rally. So you can uh, register through this uh, ArcGIS based um, product or application, everything going from simple 
communication routine procedures um, like um, when a vessel is uh, departing that routine communication we can log but we can go all the way to close cargo situations to near misses to uh, even for our uh, operational and technical standards uh, which are more technical we can uh, register where we have for example is problems or where we have radar or track problems or radar video or even camera image mm -hmm. problems can you explain how you developed your technical and operational standards before we started with the vds project uh, what was happening or going on in the docks we didn't manage, we, we were just doing uh, information system services. But to go to a VTS, we needed to log how many uh, agreements they make between the two vessels without a VTS, self-regulating uh, communication. And for that reason, we are now listening to the channel they use and registering it uh, with the silent VTS app. And by doing so, we create heat maps uh, with this application and with those heat maps, uh, we can uh, make a policy for the next years and, and how we have to train and which are the more dangerous areas in the port or where a lot of agreements need to be made in the port. We can all uh, put it on a chart and, and have, uh, do analytics on it. By putting it on the right position, we can cross-reference it to the EFF data and afterwards we know exactly uh, which vessel it was, tr then, thanks to the ATIS number from the VHF communication, we have the communication that happened, which was logged, and thanks to the silent VDS app, we have a position and what the communication was about. And with those three layers of data, we created um, a data set which we can do very advanced data analytics on later on. Yes, but I am aware that you plan to conduct a PAUSA risk assessment and I am curious why you chose for PAUSA and for example not for IREP. Can you explain a bit more to us uh, the choices you made? Thanks a lot. That's correct. Um, we are conducting a PAUSA uh, in September of this year. Um, as Port of Antwerp, we are a community builder um, uh, the relation with our stakeholders is very important for us and therefore um, we are conducting a PAUSA uh, safety assessment uh, to implement, to overview um, with, our, with our stakeholders uh, and the information that we are logging now with our uh, silent VTS um, so we can make a good choice in mitigating matters. Will you use these uh uh, heat maps from mm. your silent VTS, will they be used in the, the risk assessments? Yeah, uh, probably yes. Uh, for our policy, we can use this as a tool, uh, but it does register uh, and it cross reference communication to close quarter situations, to near misses, to uh, safe, safe uh, events as well, or um, and we've all defined those. So we have defined what's a close quarter situation in our port, because that's not the same as at sea. Uh, we don't speak about 1.5 miles for a close quarter. We speak about uh, a ship's uh, width <laughs> length of each other. Uh, that's what we call a close quarter situation. But if it's an agreement and they are happy about it, then it's actually safe. And, but we need to bring, uh, this data on a map, because if there are regions where a lot of close court situations are happening, maybe we can do something about it with the VTS and make it more safe. When I look at these images, mm -hmm. I would think that uh, the hotspots are near bridges and maybe near locks, or is there maybe something Well, uh, we are only else? a week, uh, or two weeks uh, that we are collecting data from the system. We still have to uh, make the exercises based on this first data set, but I think you're pretty close at saying bridges and uh, narrow uh, narrow channels uh, or narrow parts in the fairway will be the, the most intensive uh, regions on the heat map. So this brings us to the end of the Antwerp VTS movie. Thanks a lot to Bart and Rodrigue for inviting me. It was a pleasure to be there. 
And this brings us to the question and answer session of this webinar. And I already see a few questions in the chat box. Please feel free to raise your hand or uh, to drop a question in the chat box. I think there is one question specifically for Monica, as that was part of her presentation. And I think, Monica, if you can elaborate a bit more on the different services, because the question is, I have a question regarding the services offered by VTS. It is my understanding, and this is Torben Sommer speaking, that a VTS must be able to offer all services in SNAS and TOS. Otherwise, it is to be considered an LPS. But as I understand, Monica, a VTS should provide the services they are able to in the area. Does that mean you don't have to offer all three services? I'm really curious for your answer. I actually responded in the chat, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I have no, for the moment, uh, we still have the three uh, uh, types of services in STOS and NOS. So that's correct. Uh, and uh, whatever developments there is in the area, you should be able to interact and react on it. So uh, that, that's today's. Uh, what I was explaining was the future when we have the new resolution and then the three uh, types of services will not be there anymore. There will be only one service. That, that means that you do only have one vessel traffic service and then you will have to be able to interact and do whatever uh, means that you are uh, have to your, to your availability to, um, to control and uh, inform the traffic in the right way. Okay, thank you, Monica. I know uh, my colleague Kevin is here as he would assist me with question and answers uh, to coordinate them, but actually I think I need him to answer a question because we have a question on remote VTS training and maybe Kevin can update us on the latest developments. Yeah, thanks very much. Um... Geraldine and good day to everyone and, and thank you to you all for the interesting um, presentations. Um, so on VTS training um, and remote VTS training, we are seeing some developments of this um, around the world. And that really has taken place more out of um, the necessity uh, to continue to develop our VTS professionals during these um, challenging COVID times. And we have seen some excellent examples of this um, in various forms throughout the world. And I think as Monica alluded to um, within the chat, um, we probably will bring this into um, the VTS training related guidance, which is currently being updated um, by the VTS committee. Um, we're doing a great deal of work at the moment on the revision and updating modernization of the model courses. Um, in fact, um, in, in the coming weeks, we'll be having a, an online workshop um, discussing the updates to the courses. So some of you may wish to join in on that. Um, so at the moment, we don't explicitly um, mention online training, but it will come. Um, I think at the moment we are catered for as as the VTS training is, is it's actually quite mature for for its age um, and it's focused on the output. So I think as far as we're concerned, as long as we see high quality professionals coming out at the end of the training, the, the means we take to get to that position um, can vary to suit the, the various circumstances that we have. So whatever we do, it will be output driven that we want the high quality professionals to do this very important job. Um, and the route we take to get there can and should vary according to the local and national needs. So watch this space. Thank you, Kevin. I think we can take one more question before uh, we stop the recording of uh, this webinar. And I think this question could best be answered by Monica. 
it's a short question. Is there a guide to delimit the VTS area? Monica. Thank you, uh, Jardine. No, there is no specific guide uh, or guideline to delimit uh, VTS area, but I know that there are, are in the resolution today, uh, it mentions some constraints and what you should think of and all that, but it could be, uh, it is a very good proposal. So I will take that with me too, actually, to the committee. Yes, I think that would be a, an interesting uh, topic uh, to continue with. Um, it's now one hour uh, since we started, so this uh, brings us to the official end of the webinar. As a reminder, the next webinar on VTS training will take place on 20 May at 11 UTC. Many thanks to all of you for joining and special thanks to our excellent speakers. We will now stop the recording, but please feel free to stay and chat with us because I see many more questions and even uh, hand raised. So we will stop the recording now.